Okay, good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Those that are here live, thank you. And for those that are watching on demand, thank you for watching on demand. Whatever day you tune in, thanks so much. We've been talking about this idea of projecting negativity. It was a big deal. I can tell by the comments in the emails yesterday um, that, that this is something that a lot of us go through every day, especially if you're like a sensitive person. There are people that are like totally out to lunch. Sometimes I wonder if they have like easier lives. I feel like you're oblivious. You know, those people that walk into a room, say things that are totally offensive and they're like, they're what? But that's what, that's what he, what he looks like. Like, why shouldn't he tuck in? Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like totally. And you're gonna be like, no, 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 no. You see that person, he's actually a human being. Like you can't just say whatever's in your mind. You know those guys? Or women, usually when they get older, people like, but that's okay because I guess at a certain age, I think the filter just sort of like comes out. You know what I'm talking about? I think like, there's like it, Larry, Larry David, the Larry David, we should be like, there's, a, there's like a type of person called the Larry Davids. And like, you go to like, I think at some, at some age, the whole filter thing just drops. Like grandma, you can't say that. You know what I'm talking about? There are people that have it when they're born. They just never develop the filter. But for the people that are out there that have like a filter and they're sensitive, and they're sensitive people and they pick up on things and like they sort of can sense a room. Like, you know, that, that that's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's great. It keeps you sensitive to people and you're aware and you come into a room and there's someone new and you can sort of pick up on that. It's great. It's a great talent, but it also, if you're not aware of it, it can drive you insane. Not literally, but it can, it can make you nuts a little bit because you're constantly like, what did he think? And what did he say? And why did he say that? And you're just like making stuff up. So it's not even like what we said that like, you have to make the, the circumstance better. It's not even a circumstance. It's made up. It's not even real, but it's in your head. So when it's an experience that your experience is more negative than the circumstance, that, 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 that's not even like a challenge that came at you. That's like extra credit for challenges. You're just like adding challenges. And that means you're adding negativity, which means that you're adding disempowerment. That means you're sucking away your power. You're sucking away your positivity. You're sucking away your ability to tap into yourself and you're exhausting yourself for things that aren't even real. Real stuff. Beliefs are real, right? We know the research, the placebo effect, Herbert Benson, right? You know the story of Herbert Benson, the doctor who gave, who was treating, uh, Andy's Googling as we're speaking. Doctor who was treating women that were pregnant women that were complaining of morning sickness. You know, this research is a great research. He was treating women with morning sickness and he gave them medicine and many of them felt better. I have this actually in the book. So then he, other women came in. Yeah, Herb Benson. Other women came in and he said, let me just play around a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Like, these guys can get away with this stuff. If, I, if anyone else would do it, we'd just like go to jail. Like play around with pregnant women. Like what is he, a death wish? But I guess in the name of science, it works. So he gives them placebos. He gives them sugar pills. And many of the women feel better. Why do they feel better for? They still have morning sickness. What does a sugar pill do with feeling better? Like he didn't give you anything. He gave you a fake pill. The answer is because you believe that you're feeling better. And the belief is changing the way your body operates. Then what he did was he went further in the name of science. And he gave them Ipecac. Ipecac is a medicine that induces vomiting. Usually someone gets Ipecac if they induce the wrong thing and they have to vomit it out. So now watch this. Women come in complaining of morning sickness, which is vomiting. He gives them medicine to induce more vomiting and tells them it's going to reduce vomiting. Now you not only have a belief, you've got a belief that is up against chemicals. And for many of the women, they experience less vomiting. What in the world is going on? You're talking about putting a chemical into your body and now your brain is overriding the chemical? The answer is yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll find it next time. I don't have it in front of me. Next time I'll, I'll find you the quote from Herbert Benson. Maybe Andy could find it. Herbert Benson has this incredible quote on beliefs, how they're real. And you see if you can find it in the next few seconds. If not, I'll post it tomorrow with God's help. 
Beliefs are serious. Made up stuff is real. And your brain can't tell the difference between something that's made up or something that's real. It's just all coming into the system and processing through your mind. So whether someone actually is mad at you or you think someone's mad at you, your brain's like, whatever, I feel negative. There's a lot of stuff we're just making up. Building negative beliefs, which not only changes our brains, it changes our body. It changes our reaction. It changes how we feel. It changes our stress. It changes what we can't tap into. All that stuff. You, carry, you just project that out over the course of a lifetime. You probably handed, you know, a decade of your time to fake stuff. Imagine we probably gave false beliefs a decade of energy to find out later, like, oh, they weren't mad at me? Or I don't know if they are or if they're not. Like, why didn't they say anything? So the rule that we have to start to implement in our lives is if you don't say it, I don't think it. That is such a freeing maxim to live by. If you're upset with me or you're disappointed at something that I'm doing or saying and you don't have the guts to say something, I can't afford to think, to try to figure out what's in your head. I just can't. Not that I don't want to, not that I don't care about you. I do care about you. I just can't risk always thinking that I know what's in someone else's head. And if you care about me enough to make it worth my energy to care, at least you'll have the ability to get up and say something. Well, the reason why this is so powerful is because for most, let's say for 70% of it, it's made up. It's made up. For the 30% that's not made up, I would say the 20 left or 90% of that, whatever, 30, if you, however you want to split it up. I don't want to get too, right? Let's say if it's 70%, so the first 70 is made up. The next 20 on the list, I think you should just have the ability to say something. If it's important enough that you want me to digest it, then you should have the ability to say it. And if you can't say it, then maybe it's not important enough for me to think it. And for the next 10, maybe you'll miss something. Maybe. Maybe you'll miss someone being mad and you couldn't pick up on it. But is it worth the investment? If I give you a 10% chance of succeeding, would you take the chance? If I said 10% chance and you can, you know, in, here's get, invest money in my, in my business and you have a 10% chance of getting your money back, would you give me your money? You think money is more important than your in your emotional well-being. So for the 10% chance that that person who's not talking to you needs you to read them. But for people in your life that can't talk, like your children or whatever, but for the regular normal adult population which we interact with, if they can't muster up the ability and the courage to say something to you, we have to then go and like figure out what's in their heads mostly getting it wrong, and even when we get it right, getting it half wrong. I don't understand. If you can say it, I'm not thinking it. As soon as you start saying that to yourself and you start living with that, first of all, you look at people with some, so much more of a better light. You stop judging based on people's looks. Not like, how they look, what looks they're giving you, because you just can't tell. I learned this lesson so many times. I remember one time, I remember one time, I can't even tell you. <laughs> I can't even tell you how many times. I can't even tell you how many times. I remember one time I was just starting the book tour. I'll never forget this. I was just starting the book tour. It's like my first or second stop. I spoke at some event. And in the second row was a man. And I was talking about belief shape reality. And if you read the book, you know exactly what I was talking about. And this guy is looking at me like, like this, like, like as if like, he's like, are you, are you serious? Like he's giving me a look like, are you more like for real? Are, are you serious? Like I almost, if I could like, he was in the second row. 
right? That means he's five feet from me. He was taller than the rest. Like eyes at me the whole time, like this, like this. And I'm like, what, what am I saying? Like, what, what am I doing? Am I, what? And like, I'm spanning the room and like every time I catch his eye, I'm thinking like, what is this guy thinking? What's wrong with him? Why is he even here for? And like, I have to talk as I'm thinking, which is nearly impossible, but like, I got to keep it going. Cause I got the rest of the room. That's doesn't seem to be like giving me like those eyes. And I tried to span back and he's like second row. So I can't not look in his direction because it's rows behind him. And I'm like, and my whole speech is totally thrown by this guy. I'm like, what is this guy's problem? Maybe it's me, maybe I said the wrong thing, maybe I messed up, that this isn't wrong, that I'm not proven of sources, that I, is this the whole thing? Like what it's gonna be like? And like the whole speech, the whole time, I am like in my head trying to like figure out what's wrong with this guy while at the same time trying to remember what to say and still say smiley. Cause, and the whole thing is gone. The speech was like, it was like the most challenging process for me because of this one dude, second row, looking at me like this the whole time. And like in my head, I'm really like, who's this guy I think he is? I'm like sizing him up, but he doesn't know you, like the whole stuff. Yeah, that we can share, me and my best friends. I'll never forget, after the speech is over, or I'm signing books, he's the third guy online. I'm like, what does he want the book for? Apparently he didn't like what I had to say. He comes right up to me. I'm like waiting for it. I'm like, what did I do wrong? What did I say wrong? What don't you like? And he's like, thanks so much for that. That was really informative. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, no, I really appreciate that. Yeah, you know, I, it's a very good perspective. I didn't think like that. I'm like, what? He's like, do you mind signing a book for me? I'm like, sure. And as I'm signing the book, he takes off his glasses. And he's like, he's like playing with them. I'm like, you're all right? He's like, yeah, I got these new glasses. They're killing my eyes. They're just killing me. I can't even look straight at them. Like I gotta like squint the whole time. And I, I, I don't know. I'm like, oh, because <laughs> you, yeah, I figured because you had the reason why you were giving me those looks the entire time was because of your glasses. Of course, I gave you the benefit of doubt for that one. I'm like, I, I just lost the speech because this guy's got new glasses and I'm already thinking, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What? What's wrong with you? The guy's got new glasses. Does it always have to be about us? Is the whole world about us? If someone's in a bad mood, does it have to be because of something that I said? Can it just be that the guy's not doesn't have a perfect life? Can it be the guy's struggling with this or with that, or he's got to fight with his wife, or he got stuck on the bus? Or, it can't possibly be that he hasn't worked himself out. But we're so quick to assume that when someone else is not like happy, smiley with us, it's clearly their way of judging us that we go right into defense mode or if you're not really a defense type of person you go right into like victim mode right either you're like the let's you know there's like two different types of people either some people feel the defense and they fight them or they feel the defense and like they, they lower down i knew it wasn't enough whatever it is it's it's made up and even if it's not made up it's made up All right i'll tell you one more story and I'll, i can do this for a while but we're not gonna do this for a while so we run a trip called momentum you know this momentum is the Producers of the show. So Momentum is a trip that we take to Israel. With God's help, hopefully we're going on October this year. Tell your friends and family. Greatest weeks of my of my year. I mean, taking forget about it. Two hundred plus guys to Israel. It's like a dream. I should I should have this supposed to do it. It's a, it's an intense trip. It's an intense trip. We're speaking. We're going. It's growth oriented. It's out of your comfort zone oriented. And most guys that come to Israel, they're on this trip, they're growth oriented guys. They don't have to know anything. They don't have to be one particular type of Jew, but they have to be like open growth, you know, experiential, like, you know. Thank you, Steve. One year, I mean, whatever, but one year, I'll never forget. It's the first night I'm speaking to the guys. We come back, we're up in Tiberias. I, and I get the buses pull in, and I get to the, uh, I get to the the hotel, and waiting for me in the lobby is a rabbi. The rabbi had brought in four guys from a small city that I don't think we've ever taken from. I don't even think we've taken since. 
And he's like, I talked to you. I'm like, sure. He's like, two of my guys are just killing me. I'm like, why? They're like, no, they're, they don't want to be here. They don't want to be spoken to. They don't want to hear classes. They don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. Like, I'm like, the trip didn't even start yet, man. We just rolled in. It's day one. He's like, yeah. And I can almost hear him say it without saying it. He's like, yeah, I brought the wrong guys. Like, all you really need for this trip is a growth mindset. You just got to be a good guy that wants to grow and change and not change your life, but just be open. Just be open. And then we can grow together. If you're just not a grower, this ain't the trip for you. This isn't like, here's the hospital wave, take a picture. I mean, I could see him telling me like, I brought the wrong guys. And this poor rabbi, man, these guys rode him to the end. I mean, he, they rode him. So I speak a couple of times during the trip. Every single time, these guys are in the back, every time. And it's like speaking to like, like elementary school kids, like they're looking at each other, they're rolling their eyes. And I'm watching it because I'm in the front, I'm missing it. I'm speaking to the rabbi in between the days. I know this, these guys are like world around problems around, around, around you guys. And I remember one time I was in the Asia Torah building and I, and I met with Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Noah Weinberg's son, great guy. And I asked him like, how do I do this? And he says, when you speak, not hopefully everyone likes it, but why is your expectation that everyone has to like it? If you see somebody out there that doesn't agree with you, use it as an opportunity to build the muscle of not needing everyone to always like you every second of your life. You don't always need to have everybody like you. That's a trait. You don't, you don't need to be controlled by popular opinion. Even popular opinion is your family or your friends or the people that are in front of you. When we recognize that we don't always have to have everybody love us every second of our lives. And most of the time, it's not even about us. We've now taken like 95% of all the intangible looks or reactions that we get from the world. And we tell ourselves, if they've got an issue, let them talk to me about it. I'm not judging people. I'm not getting into someone's head. I'm not trying my life to make sure that whenever I go, everybody is like smiling. And I'm trying to do the best that I can. I'm imperfect. I'm just trying to be better. And I'm going to stumble. I'm going to fall. I'm going to try. I'm not maliciously trying to hurt people. And if there are people in this world that just can't see that, then unless we have a powwow, I'm not going to assume anything bad. And when I see people, I'm not going to assume that because they're not like smiling back and shining their light onto me, that there's even an issue with me. I'm just going to be me and try to give as much light that I can shine on other people. What I get in return is a different story. And if they don't say anything, I'm not thinking it. I can't afford to invest the most valuable resource I have, which is my emotional empowerment on things that are not real and not brought to my attention in a way that I can work with. If God wanted me to figure this out, he would have had them say something. I can't afford it. And when we recognize that every moment we spend emotionally trying to guess what someone else is saying, we're emotionally trying to please every single human being that we meet. We're going to spend our lives wasting our power. When you stop judging others, you stop judging very good, Neuron. That's exactly right. We are givers. We're striving to be givers. I don't need to figure out what's in your head. I walk into a room and you have a sour face. I don't gotta like, do you like, I don't gotta do that. I'm me. You wanna talk about it? I'm great. If not, I'm assuming you're awesome. You give me a look, it's probably your glasses. You're giving me like, you're, you're a huff and a puff. You're probably having a hard day for something else. And if it's not, I'll take the risk that 
I missed a cue and you'll have to keep on huffing and puffing until you'll grow up and you'll say to yourself, huh, I'm an adult too. I'm not going to huff and puff to get their attention. I'm actually going to use my words like we tell our children and I got to like say something to somebody else and then we can deal with it like adults. And until that, we're good, man. I got to stay positive because I got to accomplish big things in this world and I'm not going to accomplish it if I'm like a reed swaying on everyone else's facial expressions. I don't know if that was too direct or not. That's strength. Those are the people that we respect. They, they got something. It's authentic. That's what we need to build inside ourselves. We're, 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 we're givers of light. We're not trying to dodge and dodge and dodge and weave public opinion. All right, we'll continue. We'll continue. As you can tell, this is a subject that matters to me. Like every other subject we talk about. We'll continue this. Let's try to continue this today. Try today when you see one, if you have one person in your life that you see today that you're not sure, just try to like pull out, deep breath and say, I'm sure it's fine. If they're not saying anything, I'm not thinking it. My job, right, pause, good. Just increase the light, we're good, man. All right, thanks for tuning in. Have an incredible day. Thanks for being here. And with God's help, I cannot wait to see you again tomorrow morning.